funny this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Did I turn this on? Is this on? Yep. All right. Okay. Work crew's coming in. Work crew. Okay. God can do anything. Let's all stand.
requests this morning. All right, a couple things that I know of, at least right off, we need to be praying for. Uh, let's see here. It is, I'm going to look it up because otherwise I'll get it wrong. Uh oh, Josh got offended. We're going to pray. <laughs> Sandy Schumann, Mike and Anna Fleming's daughter, is really going through it with seizures. She keeps having seizures and trying to get things under control. And so we'll be praying for Sandy Schumann. Uh, we'll get her right here on our list. And uh, also uh, for Pat Devaney, for the Pat, uh, just not too long ago, here a couple days ago, fortunately, Sally was driving because Pat was sitting in the passenger seat and blacked out. Uh, they're, they're considering the possibility of a seizure. They looked. There was no sign of stroke. Uh, but obviously there is cause for concern there. So be praying for Brother Pat. It looks like we're going to get them back pretty soon, by the way. They've got their house down there in Florida is now under contract, and so they're selling it and, and come back up here, and they ain't going back. And uh, for which I I don't feel horrible about. <laughs> right? I like having, having those folks around here. Uh, and then... Uh, Brother Doug Davis, uh, we really be praying for Brother Doug. Uh, he is in, a, in pretty rough shape uh, there in, in Suncrest, and he's continually having many strokes, and they're having a hard time getting them under control. It's just something that continues to happen and uh, is really uh, causing him to struggle. Uh, he's getting very depressed about all of that. Think, you know, as far as not being able to uh, leave Suncrest anytime soon uh, and things. And that's, that's really difficult on him. So be praying for Brother Doug, also for uh, uh, Rosemary there as well then. Brother Steve or Brother Dan, well, one of you, Kevin usually takes care of this, but one of you guys please get those doors closed there as people are coming in. We don't uh, limit distractions as much as we can. Continue praying for uh, Rose Govitz. Uh, and uh, the things that she's dealing with, health-wise, uh, just continues to struggle, but pray for strength there. Margaret MacArthur, uh, be praying for her. These are all things that came up in men's prayer breakfast yesterday, okay? Uh, and so uh, Margaret was uh, just doing some cooking or whatever in the kitchen, and one of her knees just totally gave out on her. She went right down, and uh, so that was a, a bit of a difficulty there, so be praying for Margaret. Um, and uh, so, any, any other prayer requests here this morning? Yes, ma'am, Vicki? Um, I got two. Uh, Angie Conklin, C O N K L I N. She's a friend. Well, she's my daughter's friend. She's, my friend. Mm -hmm. she's been having just an ongoing struggle with back issues and has had numerous surgeries and procedures. And I think we prayed for her before with those. Yes, yeah, yeah. and she is continuing to be in just horrible pain. Okay. They just can't seem to get, I don't know if they get figured out or not. Sure. Or what they do. So Angie Conklin is yeah. still, still dealing with that. Still thing. dealing so with that. Right and then Dan, I understand Dan and Debbie Day have been very sick for a few they've been, they've been dealing with some things. Hopefully they'll be here before too much longer. I, I talked to Debbie uh, uh, just the other day. We were chatting a little bit. Uh, uh, well, when the when the call went out there the other day, they, they contacted me after that. But um, yeah, they've just been really sick. Kind of one thing right after another. One of them gets better, the other one gets sick, and the other, that one gets better, the other one gets sick. It's kind of going back and forth. That's what, one reason we haven't seen them in quite a while. So I'll uh, be praying for the days uh, to be strengthened, and Lord will, we'll be able to see them very soon. Okay? And then uh, Penny. Um, my daughter, Jennifer Taylor, Friday she was doing stuff with her truck and she slipped twice on the ice and the second time she injured her toe so she might be out work for a while so she needs prayers. All right, Jennifer Taylor slipped on the ice a few times and hurt her toe. No fun. And it's painful I've done that. Yeah, yeah, most of us have been there at least once in our life, right? Injure a toe. That'll mess with your 
day and week and month and however long it takes, right? Yeah. She's praying for Jennifer Taylor. Anybody else this morning? Yes, ma'am, Nancy. Never mind, Franklin. He's going to have surgery for a Okay. So Nancy's son, Franklin, is having surgery this morning. Okay. All right. Roseanne. Yes, sir. You yeah, we got uh, the rescheduled for that library thing. Mm -hmm. It's going to be at the center voting in March. All right. Yeah, the library um, meeting is supposed to take place in February. They're rescheduled for March, and we'll keep you all informed on that one. Okay. Anybody else this morning? Yes, ma'am. Terry. Janice still. Janice. I had her on here too, but failed to mention that. Janice. Uh, Chibaleski. Got to think about that one before I say it. Um, uh, she had some surgery done uh, here this last week, and it went well, but she's recovering and takes some time. Okay, so we praying for her recovery, strengthening. Yes, ma'am, Vicki? It's the praise that um, Josh Gomez was not injured in that field that he went through with his car that he yeah. was telling us this morning about. Uh, somebody else that had the same thing happen to them, and they actually came through the windshield, hit the guy in the face, yeah. <clears throat> and then went into the back seat of the car where the toddler was seated. Yeah. Luckily, he didn't hit the baby, but... Brother Josh had a bit of a bit of an accident here the other day, and uh, could have been a whole lot worse. He came out of that one doing all right, so praise the Lord for that. All right. Anybody else this morning, prayer requests or praises, would like those too? All right, let's take these before the Lord this morning, and we'll continue on with our uh, Sunday school time. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your love to us, Lord. We're, we're grateful that we can bring, Lord, our needs and our requests, our petitions uh, to you, make them known to you. We can come boldly and lay them at your feet. And, Lord, we, we know that uh, for each of these, Lord, you are the one who can do anything. And Lord, we, uh, we sang about that this morning, sang your praises about how you can do anything. And just a, a simple Sunday school song, the Lord, so much truth. And we're grateful that we serve, uh, Lord, an omnipotent God this morning. Lord, we pray for each of these requests, many of them uh, on this list. And, uh, and just uh, too many more to, to go into detail on. But you know each situation. We pray for Sandy Schumann. Uh, Brother Pat Devaney, uh, Brother Doug Davis, Lord, and Rosemary, I pray that you'd be with them this morning. Uh, be with Rose, Lord, we miss her around here, and would you continue to touch her, and uh, thank you for the blessing that she is. Margaret, Lord, with this uh, uh, scare here the other day. Uh, Angie Compton, Lord, with this continuing back pain, would you give her some comfort, give her some relief, give the doctors wisdom on how they should handle that, Lord. I pray that you continue to be with uh, the days. And it'd be uh, good to see them soon, or would you uh, strengthen their bodies and bring them back to us soon? Be with Jennifer Taylor, who fell and hurt her toe, Lord. I know that can certainly take some time to, to get back on your feet and things and doing what you normally do. So would you help her to recoup quickly? Uh, Nancy's son, Franklin, as he's got this surgery Wednesday, Lord, I know this is going to be a good thing for him. But Lord, I pray that the surgery be successful and that it would... Uh, uh, cause any issues at all or that wouldn't have any problems. It goes smoothly. Uh, and thank you, God, that you uh, brought uh, Roseanne and Eugene's car back to them, that it wasn't as serious as it could have been. And uh, as far as that goes, Lord, we thank you that Brother Josh wasn't injured in this accident uh, and, uh, Lord, that it could have been a whole lot worse. Thank you for his safety. Thank you for watching over him. Uh, be with Janice, Lord, as she continues to recover from her surgery as well. Strengthen her body, Lord. I pray that John and Josh would be a blessing to her in that time. And, um, Lord, then we also, uh, once again, bring before you this issue of the library. Lord, this sure is turning into a lot of back and forth and things in our community. Lord, I pray that you would just intervene and, Lord, that your will would be done. Lord, that we would be able to see some progress for, uh, for uh, things that are right and things that are wholesome and pure. And, Lord, I pray that we would be... Uh, keeping a very clear and clean testimony through it all. Lord, that you'd help us to act as you would have us to act in each situation there. 
Lord, we commit this time to you. We look forward to what you have for us from your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's take your Bibles and turn to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. And as you're turning there, we do have several announcements this morning. And we're going to go through all of it in the bulletin here later on. But I did want to mention, how many of you uh, got a phone call? I believe it would have been Thursday night. Uh, asking you to press one or two, or if you didn't need to know us at all, press the key, right? Uh, how many of you tried to have a conversation with me when, I, when you answered the phone? Yeah, Brother Joe did. I did that. Okay. I had a conversation. You had a conversation. Okay. With, oh, with my father. Yeah. Yeah, so you called back. You see, what it is is we can choose what number comes up on the caller ID. So if you cross me, I'm putting your number on it next, okay? I'm kidding about that. That was supposed to be funny. But when we put the church's phone number on there, well, the church's phone number is forwarded to Pastor's cell phone. So after that phone call came out, he answered his phone about a half a dozen times or so, uh, talking to a couple people, and then someone called him at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Uh, they just, they saw, oh, I saw I missed the call. I don't know who this is. I'm going to call him back. And, uh, you know, so if you did not get a call, let me ask you this. Did anybody in here not get a call on their phone? Wonderful. We want to make sure you're getting those. Uh, what it is, is that is just a new way for us to be able to stay in touch with our church as far as uh, special prayer requests that come up. Some things every now and again, someone gets a hold of pastor and they say, I really have a big prayer need that's urgent right now. And then what pastor has to do is, as so far, he's had people's numbers, and at this point, he doesn't even know who's on what list or whatever, uh, stored in a group, in a couple of different groups on his phone. His phone can only send to so many people at once, so he does a whole bunch of text messaging to try to get that out. Well, this is one way he can call a number, record a message, hit a button, and it goes out to everybody on the list at once. Um, the, our, the men in our church should have gotten a call then uh, this past uh, Friday night, uh, talking about, just reminding me about the men's prayer breakfast. So the men already also have their own call group for announcements pertaining to the men in our church. Ladies have one as well, so when it comes time to do some uh, uh, updating and things on that, we'll, uh, <laughs> I'm looking over there. I've got our, our after hours phone for harsh oil and propane, and it's ringing right at the moment. So <laughs> after Sunday school, Brother Joe might be leading the choir this morning. I'm supposed to sing in church this morning, too. This could get interesting, everybody. All right. <clears throat> but uh, uh, propane's going to have to wait. Fortunately, it's sunny this morning. Anyway, uh, uh, but yeah, this is something, uh, uh, for instance, we've got the choir. The choir is also in its own call group. So when we have, if we have a last minute change about a Friday practice or something, we can call everybody very quickly and get the word out to them. Uh, once we get all of our volunteers together on our list for Vacation Bible School, they'll be in a separate call group so we can keep you updated on that. If there's something that needs to be put out there and it's not time for a service or a, a bulletin announcement, okay? We don't have time for that. So, uh, if you aren't on that, but you would like to be, let me know. Maybe maybe your spouse is on it. We might have only had one number for you, so maybe your spouse got a call and you did not. We'd love to make sure we've got both of your phones on there. So, yeah, let us know, okay? Uh, we've got that going on. Uh, let's see, there was something else I was going to mention. Oh, this is what I was going to mention. This is Sunday school. I'll mention it up here. Uh, and Pastor, I'm sure, will we'll say something about it in church. But, uh, folks, please make sure, please make sure that your phones are silented. Silent? Silented? Quieted? On silent. Silenced. Thank you. Silence. Uh, silented sounds better. Sounds gooder. Uh, but uh, anyway, please make sure that your phones are silenced. Uh, if you would, uh, you know, put them on vibrate or just on silent. There you have to shut it right off. That'd be great. And then uh, we won't get distracted at all. But uh, notice there's been a couple couple weeks in a row where right as we're getting to decision time and the invitation, we get a phone ringing. And uh, it winds up being a pretty pretty severe distraction to what the Holy Spirit is trying to do at that moment. And so uh, please make sure that your phones are off. Uh, how many of you even know your phone is off right now? All right. How many of you would be willing to go ahead and check anyway? <laughs> All right. I mean, I know it's off. I know it's off. And then two minutes later, it rings, right? Uh, but uh, let's turn to Galatians chapter 4. 
Galatians chapter 4 this morning, and uh, we're going to get done with this lesson today, and we may start on the next one here as well. So I do have uh, some sheets for that once we get there, but um, we're talking about this, this the heirs of God in Christ, and the threat to that position. Remember, this is a position now that we have in Christ. This is where we dwell as Christians. This is something that cannot be taken away from you. This is a position that cannot be taken away from you. What you can do is stop operating in that position and go back to living uh, as the old man wants you to. Does that mean that you're no longer a child of God? No, it means that you've started operating outside of that position and uh, you're not going to be accomplishing the will of God in that, that scenario. And so uh, we want to make sure that we're remaining in our position, operating in our position in Christ. Uh, and there are many threats to that to try to not knock you out of that position, because they can, but to lure you out of that position. They sure can. To lure you, and I'll put it this way, to lure you out of a position of walking in the spirit to a point of walking in the flesh. And when you're walking after the things of the flesh, you're going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you're walking after the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so that's why it's so important that a Christian dwells in this position in Christ. We talked about this, that one of the threats to our position is turning back to the principles of this world. Turning back to things that are not uh, spiritually motivated. Should we follow what the world tells us to do? To an extent, yes. We should obey every ordinance of man, right? We're supposed to obey the law, follow the law according to... You know, as long as it's not anti-biblical, going against what Scripture says, because we're to obey God rather than men, right? So God is our supreme authority given to us in the Bible. The Bible is our sole authority for faith and practice. That's what we say, uh, what we believe, as, as, and that is, a, that is one of our Baptist distinctives, by the way. Something that sets us apart as Baptists from many other denominations is our adherence to the fact that the Bible is our authority. And no man is going to change that. Other places, other denominations will bring in man's reasoning. They'll bring in priesthood. They'll bring in uh, uh, those sort of things as, in, as an interpreter of what God said that you should follow. And, and they follow after those things. Sometimes even you have, for instance, the Pope that speaks, if I can remember the term here, Ex-cathedra, thank you. I had forgotten, but yes. Ex-cathedra, which uh, I believe it means from the chair, is what that essentially means in Latin or whatever it is. Uh, uh, but what that means is that he is speaking new revelation from God to the church. And that's supposed to be done away with, <laughs> according to the scripture. And so that's something that sets a Baptist apart, Baptist distinctives, Baptist beliefs apart from many other denominations. So one day maybe we'll be able to go through, uh, say one day, <laughs> we'll be a, uh, probably a couple months study on Baptist distinctives. And why is it, why is it that we're Baptist, okay? You ever wonder, why is it that I go to a Baptist church? Okay, maybe you don't, maybe you don't wonder that. Uh, and, but there are very, very specific reasons why uh, uh, there is no way in this world I would ever give up the name Baptist. That is a conviction, a biblical conviction on my part. But anyway, that's not our study today. But turning back to the principles of this world, we can serve the world's gods. There are many. We can conform to the world's principles. Boy, that's a tough one going on right now. A lot of pressure, a lot of pressure for God's people to conform to the world's principles these days. You don't believe so? Show up at the library meeting in March and you'll find out that there's a lot of pressure to conform to the world's principles. We can depend on externals. Going to the things that we can judge and we can see, that we can discern in our own mind without the help of the Spirit. And depending on those things to somehow be uh, uh, what makes us spiritual, right? And what, what helps us to be, uh, 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 to be sanctified. 
And that's not right either. We can't depend on the externals, things like how we dress, how we act, how we talk, where we go to church, what we eat, what we don't eat. Those were some big things in this day. In Galatians, uh, when, when Paul was writing the book, to the book uh, here to uh, this epistle to the church in Galatia, uh, that was a big deal was the externals. Because remember, they're just coming out of being under the law. And the law was all about externals. It was all about making God's people distinct from the world around them. That was that, that's what the law did, and so that they they're coming from now. All these externals, they're 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 trying to Paul's trying to get them to understand these externals were a way to show you that you needed grace. You cannot keep to all the external requirements of the law. It's impossible. You're not going to do it. You need grace. And so the externals aren't going to be able to keep us sanctified, but some people may try, and it's a threat to our position in Christ. We can also turn away from God's message. We turn when we lose our desire for truth. Well, when was the last time you just craved time in the Word of God? I mean, you just couldn't wait to open it up. Boy, I tell you, there are some times I open it up, and I'm going, I don't feel like doing this right now. There are other times where if I miss it, if I miss it, oh, do I crave it. I want it badly. I want that time with God. I need the truth. And if you ever get to a point in your Christian life where you have lost your desire to spend time in the Word of God, that should be a good warning sign to us that there may be something drastically wrong in our relationship with God. We may have slipped out of our position in Christ and, that, and operating in that. Uh-oh. All right, I won't say anything, but uh, we'll, we'll go just like this. Anyway, <laughs> gotta love the phone thing, right? Uh, I might have meant something else. Right, but anyway, sorry. That was, it was too good. It, it always happens right at a, a pause in everything else, right? <laughs> yes, sir. I, I, I just had a question on your uh -oh. use of terms. Yes. When you say relationship, should it not be fellowship? Because our relationship is solid and strong no matter what we do or what happens around us. That that could you could uh, I mean we're related to Christ as his Oh brother. sure. Unequivocally, irrevocably. Absolutely. I, I just, I guess, I'm sensitive to those terms, and I don't know if that's a problem or not. But I'll tell you what: I have fellowship with you, and I have fellowship with my wife, but our relationships are very, very different. Very different. Yes. Very different. Whereas in Christ, when I, when, and, and because, and, and some reasons are that I spend a whole lot more time in fellowship with her. She's a lot prettier. And she is gorgeous. I tell you what, she has a lot more hair. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, by the way, side note, I don't know if anybody else knows what, does anybody else know what a Gabe's is? Store, the Gabe's, anybody? Okay, you owe it to yourself. There's one in Utica. They just opened. We were down there yesterday, and I said, Ashley, there's a Gabe's. And we went, <gasps> because it's an amazing place, okay? Uh, had nothing to do with your question. Um, relationships, yes, you are related to Christ. Can someone be related to someone else and not have a good relationship with them? Well, a, a good fellowship with them. I, I see what you're saying. I, I think it's a, it's the, in a, in a secondary definition of the term. Sure. Relationship. And I don't know, I personally feel uncomfortable applying the same word to our our actual place as a brother or sister of Christ, mm -hmm. as a po as a son or daughter of God, as opposed to a relationship being, you know, that's something that wanes and grows. Mm -hmm. I, 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 maybe I'm just... No, that, that, I understand what you're saying, uh, in that I think it is... We're talking about the same thing, again, just using a different terminology. Um, and essentially what we are dealing with here is at some point 
if you have, let get back to kind of what we're talking about, when you lose your desire for the truth, it could very well be that your fellowship, the fellowship aspect of your relationship with God exactly. has, has been dwindling, it's suffering. Yeah. Brother Josh, I think I saw your, I saw a look on your face, I knew you'd probably already jump in there, go ahead. That's, that's, that's just standing versus state. Say that again? Standing versus state. Explain, please. Your standing in Christ is always a child of God. Never, the relationship is never going to change. You can never be unborn out of the family of God. But right. your state of your fellowship can be different. That's a good way to put it. Up standing versus state. Good, good way to put it. You will constantly be, you will never be out of a, a relation with God, a relationship with God. You, would, you always will have that relationship because... Your standing with God is that in that position, you are God's child. You are an heir of God in Christ, Amen. period. Whether you like it or not, if you're a born-again Christian, that is what you are. Amen. And you cannot change it, and God can't change it. Why? Well, that goes back all the way to what we studied in the last couple studies about God's covenant with Abraham. And there was a covenant with Abraham and a promise, and you are a child of the promise God made to Abraham, and that was a covenant before the law. It was before the law. The law didn't change anything about that covenant. I get goosebumps thinking about that. That is such an amazing study to study that out. We're going to look even more of that in the next uh, the next bit that we go through. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, Isaac and Ishmael a little bit and some of the things that they, uh, how they pertain to this relationship, if you would. So uh, uh, losing our desire for God's truth. At first, the Galatians were thankful for the truth. I mean, wouldn't you be? I, weren't you when you first found out the truth about salvation and about what you could have in Christ? I mean, we didn't even scratch the surface, most of us, when we trusted Christ. Scratch the surface of what that actually meant. Okay? Uh, uh, that's like, that's that's like uh, 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 you know, I don't know, I'll get off track. But, uh, but finding out that as a member of some club, you also get access to all these other benefits. Uh, here's, I'll give you an example, okay? Uh, we like to do stuff with our kids. We homeschool our kids. So we like to go to some museums and such uh, whenever we can. And, you know, two trips to the Henry Ford for a family of six is expensive. Yeah. However, one and a half trips worth of fees, entry fees, will also pay for a year's membership. And so we got a membership there. Great. Now there's also the one up in Flint, the Sloan Museum, that's paired up with the, the planetarium up there. Amazing stuff. A lot of fun. A lot of fun for the kids, and the museum is brand new. They've got some neat stuff for kids in there, uh, and they've got cool cars for the not kids. Uh, but neat stuff in there. There's a tank in there, guys. I mean, tank. All right, being done. Got a grunt when you say that, but uh, I need stuff. So we got a membership up there. I mean, that one's closer than Henry Ford. I mean, it's a 25-minute drive to Sloan Museum, and so we got a membership there. We've been there, I don't know, three or four times already on that membership. Well, what we found out is that membership is also a Science Center passport, and what that means is we have access. We found this out after we got the membership. We have access to hundreds of science centers all over the country. Every state has like three or four, some of them six or seven, that we can go into as being members of this one. It's like, hey, cool, I didn't even know about this. This is awesome, right? And so we were coming back for uh, from Christmas, coming back up and coming through uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and there in Cleveland, uh, right next to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We didn't go in that one. But right next to it uh, is the Great Lakes Science Center, one of only 10 NASA uh, visitor centers in the country. Hmm. And it was so cool. Well, guess what? Our membership in Flint <laughs> took care of that one. And uh, it was great. So well, all that to say, they were thankful for the truth. They had just gotten in. And so often we just get saved. We have no idea the benefits that come. I mean, how many of you got saved because you wanted to be an heir of God in Christ? Probably not many of us, if any. No, you got saved. I'll tell you why I got saved. I was terrified of going to hell. Mm -hmm. Some people will say that's not a good enough reason. Well, why God make it so scary? Anyway, 
All right. I was terrified of going to hell. Why did he put me in anyway? Why did I think I was going to hell? Because I knew I was a sinner. Amen. That was the whole point. And so I was terrified of that. I got saved. And as a 10-year-old kid, I didn't get saved so that I could now enter into a deep relationship with Almighty God. No, oh, I was terrified of going to hell. Okay. That's why I got saved. I had no idea what that would open up to me in the future. It's like buying a ticket to Disney World and never going through the tunnel to get into Disney World. Okay, you bought the ticket. We're so excited. We got a ticket. We get to go to Disney World. We got a ticket to salvation. We get to go to heaven. But you have no idea the adventure that you could have if you just take a few more steps. And they were so thankful for the truth. And they started on this, this journey with God. But somewhere along the way there, and somewhere along the journey, they no longer wanted the truth. At some point in the journey, they started listening more to human reasoning. And they went back to the old schoolmaster, back to the law, and back under all these ways of mankind and all these externals. They were convinced, and they no longer sought after the truth. Instead, they went after what sounded good to them. The truth doesn't always make sense, but the truth doesn't change because our reasoning says differently. And so they were struggling with that. They no longer wanted the truth. Then last week we mentioned this, that we turn when we listen to false teachers. Sometimes it's not because we've just given up on our fellowship with God. It's not because we've just said, we got maybe bitter or angry at God, or we've... No. Sometimes the turning away from God... If this is the path we're supposed to be on, all that it was was that amount. Just that little bit. Hardly anything. But you know, if you're an inch off here, by the time you get what's straight north of us here? Let's see. Marlette. Okay, yeah, Marlette. And say I'm going to Marlette, and I'm going to start by going like this. I'm going to end up in Lake Superior. I'm not going to hit Marlette. Just that little bit off. Why? And so that's why the devil will bring in false teachers that really, really are very convincing. What's their goal? Why they gather a following. I'm looking back there. You all are all looking up here. <laughs> I pointed back there. I saw some people back there. I, I'm sorry. I've got the same thing on the back wall, so I don't have to keep going like this. Uh, uh, but what's the goal of false teachers? To gather a following. Well, how can they get so many people to follow them if what they say doesn't make sense? Doesn't sound like sound reasoning. This stuff will sound good. But if you look at it against the standard, it's not right. Go ahead. Just what you're talking about, like, I've been experiencing lately with like mm -hmm. hyper dispensationalists, yeah, and those that believe that the church started with Paul as soon as he got the revelation, but not now uh -huh. Acts chapter two, and they say all these heady, high-minded things that sound kind of like almost like you could follow, like the sure, because they're intelligent. Along with the Calvinists, they're intelligent. Yeah, absolutely, people are attracted to intelligent speech, big words, and all that. Yeah. They say, oh, what a great teacher, but it goes over their head. Yeah. But the, I just, but, but what the truth is, is easy to receive. That a child can receive it. It's easy to be taught. But these guys are teaching this stuff that, oh, I, I think I know, but I'm not sure where he's going with that. But he's smart, so he must know. But yeah. that's the false teacher. But a, a, the truth is easy. It's not really that hard. You know, take. there was, uh, uh, I had a, one person tell me one time, you wouldn't know who he was. Got a guy out in Iowa. I was chatting with him one time. He hadn't been to church in a long time because he knew better than the pastor and everything. You know what? He might have known better than the pastor. But that's no reason to sit out of church. Uh, but anyway, he knew better than the pastor, and he just insisted the pastor was teaching false doctrine. This is a really nice guy, by the way. Great guy. He loved the Lord. Oh, he loved the Lord. Giver to the Lord's work. Just not that church anymore. And he was trying to convince me that because the church began with Paul, 
that only the Pauline epistles were what pertained to today's church. And that the rest of the Bible was good for us to know and understand because it showed us how it led up to the church age. Hyperdispensationalism. Okay, that's what we're talking about there. Dispensationalism deals with how God dealt with mankind according to his covenants at different times throughout history. And there are very specific dispensations in the Bible. And you've got to be very careful about that because if you get into hyper-dispensationalism, that's what will tell you that everything that's under all those other dispensations, they don't apply to me. I don't need them. And that all preaching should be done only out of the Pauline epistles. And that the rest of the Bible is for reference. And you can't even really trust Hebrews because that was only written to the Hebrews. And did Paul really write it? They really don't know. Okay, that kind of stuff. And so that takes it a little... Now, now listen. If you sat down and listened to somebody say that for a, for a while... By the way, just in case there's confusion, I don't hold to that belief at all. Okay. The Bible says that all scripture is given by right. God is profitable right. for doctrine. By the way, who wrote that, Josh? Paul. Paul. <laughs> who did he write it to? Was it Timothy? He wrote it to Timothy. You know what else he wrote to Timothy a couple chapters before? That from a child, you've had the Holy Scriptures. Timothy was the son of a Jewish woman and a Greek father. He was not born to a rabbi. He didn't have... Do you think that Timothy, that Paul was taught that from a child... Now this is years before then, that Timothy had access... To any of the epistles Paul had written up to that point? Absolutely not. He may have heard of them in church or something, but he would not have been taught the scriptures from a child. Certainly his mother and grandmother would not have known how to teach him doctrine from Paul's epistles at that point. What were they teaching him? What was available to the common people? Old Testament. And Paul, the same one that says all scripture is given by God and is profitable for doctrine and all those other things, told Timothy, you've had the scripture since you were a child. He's talking about the Old Testament. Yeah. So that blows the hyper-dispensationalism thing right out of the water and that, that you need the Pauline epistles to be able to follow Christ. No, look, you, we need the whole book. That's right. yeah. We need the whole thing. Yes, ma'am. I like the discussion this morning, by the way. We might not get through this one today. Go ahead. That's all right. Over and over. The new dispensation, so Absolutely. Like... Now, there will be an argument about that. Yeah. Don't mean to put you on the spot. There will be an argument about that saying that Jesus was born under the law. He was therefore under the law. And the dispensation of grace didn't start until after Christ was resurrected and the church began. Now, <laughs> we're getting really deep into stuff here, okay? But this is where you see how easy it would be to get confused about even something very simple to what we believe. We can say we believe that, but when someone challenges that, you got to know why you believe what you believe. And the truth of the matter is, Christ referenced the Old Testament over and over and over, especially in the book of Matthew, when Matthew was trying to tell the Jews, he's your king. He's the, he's the one that, that fulfilled the law. He's the one that fulfilled the prophecies. And so Matthew was telling him over and over and over uh, about that one. And so... Uh, 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 yeah, <laughs> Jesus referred to that as well. And it's amazing. Jesus never preached out of the Pauline epistles. Anyway, <laughs> all right. But uh, moving right along. Okay, no, good discussion. And so you see that as these teachers come up with these things to say, they can get a quick following just because it sounds good. Well, good heavens. Uh, 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 Charles Manson had a following. Yeah. People believed him. People believe what he had to say. So there are people out there that will believe something that at least sounds reasonable and good. And so we've got to be careful that you've got to go back to the standard. You've got to go back to the standard. You ever, you ever buy a really cheap tool of some kind and find out it just doesn't quite work? Oh, I'll get the cheap version. There's a reason why snap-on tools and map tools exist. They are precision-made. 
They are to the standard. Cheap knockoff tools aren't always to the standard, and they sometimes just won't work for the job. We've got to continually go back and measure it up and say, does this line up with Scripture? Is what this person is telling me, now, I've never heard of this before. I better make sure that what they're saying is the truth. If you've never heard it before, if you've been in church for a while, even if it's been just a few years, if you've been walking with the Lord for just a few years, and you hear something that's totally new, and something in your heart goes, mm -hmm. you better check it out. That little tick in your heart might just be the Holy Spirit saying, now what they're saying is true, but you need to know it for sure, because you're going to need it someday. By the way, that's a, this is why, I'm going right back to the first chapter of Galatians here. This is why when a pastor gets up to preach, he says, open your Bibles too. We're not putting anytime soon. I stopped doing it. I stopped doing this. We're not putting the scripture up on the screen. I don't want anybody to get in the habit of not having your Bible open in church. This is the standard. Don't go off what I say. Don't go what I put up on the screen. That's a dangerous thing too. Our pastor in Iowa once preached an entire sermon and he put all he, he he likes putting all the scripture up on the screen. He uses a lot of scripture. He had copied and pasted it, and he didn't realize his e sword that he copied and pasted it out of, and had switched over to the NIV on it. Oh my! He preached the whole sermon out of the NIV, and everybody in church is sitting here. Now this is what the good part. Everybody's in church going, "This isn't adding up." Finally, right toward the end of the message, someone said, "Pastor, is this?" What Bible are you preaching on? And it got interesting, okay? Uh, but but listen, that's, that's, have your Bible open. Have your Bible open. You know what? Uh, study notes in your Bible are incredible, but they're not inspired. Does it line up with what you're reading? False teachers also stir people up about the wrong things. Usually, about the externals. Making more of those external things. Making more of something than the Bible makes of it. You know, we ought to stick with the truth. But don't base an argument for the faith on something the Bible doesn't say. Okay? I'm going to use a term that I don't like to use. But this is seen on signs and God forbid it ever gets seen on a sign that one of our church members is holding at a library function or anything else. But when the Bible, when people hold up a sign that says God hates queers, or all, I can't even say the other term I was going to use, all queers are going to burn in hell. Okay, listen, it's not what the Bible says. What if that person has trusted Christ? Right? Exactly. That makes them your brother or sister. Oh boy. Yes, ma'am. And what if that person is too is going to trust Christ in the future? Because God only knows that. It's not the part of that means everybody has. Those things do so much damage to the cause of Christ. And the false teachers. I'm just going to call this one out. Westboro Baptist is a false teacher. Right. It is a mother of false teachers. And what they try to do in God's name is absolutely horrible. And we should not ever have any kind of a part in it. Ever. Because they're false teachers trying to stir people up about the wrong things. And what they're saying is unscriptural. Now, Let's get to today's part of the lesson, just as we're about to wrap up here. So we need some protection from the threat. Protection from the threat. Let's look at verses 18 and 20 of Galatians, 18 through 20 of Galatians chapter 4. This is what Paul tells him. He said, but it is good to be zealously affected. Now remember, he just told them, these people zealously affect you, but it's not good. 
He said, but it's good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. And not only when I'm present with you, he's telling them, you don't need me to be able to instruct you in the way you should go. You don't need me to have fellowship with God. You should go after the things of God even on your own. You don't need me there to babysit you through it. You can study doctrine. You can study deep things without me there. It's okay. Look what, he, look what he says in verse 19. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. In other words, he's saying this. I, want, I wish I could be there so you could hear the tone of my voice. You're doing so well. You've been doing so well. Someone hindered you. Someone pulled you back. You started listening to a false teacher. You started going after some things that weren't the truth. Listen, you don't need me there to hold your hand. You can study this truth out by yourself. Get in the scriptures. Get in the word of God. Look at the standard. Hold these things up that these people are teaching you to the standard. You don't need me to be the one telling you that. This is what he's finally getting at. He's going, I am going to correct you because why? Why? I put a lot of work into you. <laughs> I'm not going to let you just fall by the wayside and say, oh, well, I tried. No, he said, I put a lot of work into you. I travailed, he said, in birth for you. I worked hard to get you into the kingdom. Now, listen, you don't need me there for your Christian growth. In other words, he's telling them, take some responsibility for your own Christian growth. You need to start doing these things yourself. And he said, I wish you could hear me because I'm not being condescending. I'm not trying to beat you up with my language. He said, I'm just trying to help you. And I wish that you could hear what I'm trying to say. How can we keep turning away from God and falling back in our old ways? In these verses here, we catch a glimpse of Paul's desire for the Galatian believers. He writes that he would go all over again and struggle to teach them the gospel so that Christ would be continually born in them. And this picture represents... Sanctification. That's the idea here. And that is a continuing work. We're, once again, church, none of us have arrived. None of us are now sanctified. Sanctification is a continual process. It's going to keep going on until you go to heaven. I can't wait till I'm sanctified, Josh. You can't wait till I'm sanctified either, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know how to take that. All right, but anyway, uh, uh, no, that's, that, exactly. What a day that's going to be. And this is what he's saying here. He's saying keep a focused zeal. Keep a focused zeal. You know, the world admires zealous people. People who sacrifice a whole lot to attain some kind of status or goal. Our heads turn when we see someone that devotes an extreme amount of time and energy to accomplish something amazing. Maybe it's a new world record sprint. Hey, ain't happen for me. Maybe it's an inspiring piece of music or some kind of mind-blowing invention. But maybe it's because we serve a very zealous, passionate God who's dedicated to his children and his glory. And something in us responds to that passion. See, it's not enough to be zealous Christians. Let me say that again. See, that's, you, that could pertain to a lot of externals. It's not enough to be a zealous Christian. It's about being zealous about, what did he say there in verse 18? In a good thing. In the first verse just before, verse 17, he said, they zealously affect you, but not well. In other words, it's not enough to be a, just a zealous Christian. We need to be zealous about the right things. About good things. Songs can stir us up. Servants can stir us up, and they should. But if they don't stir us up toward godliness, it's not what we should be zealous about. When I was a Bible college student, I keep mentioning Brother Josh in here, okay? You, I know you understand exactly what I'm saying here. Brother Josh, when I was a college student, there was a bunch of us college student, young preacher boys, who 
got really fired up about certain preachers had nothing to do with the content or the depth of their messages. It had everything to do with how entertaining they were. That's not right. That's not what I should be zealous of. False teachers may use good things to stir us up in wrong ways. They get us excited about a social movement or good personal finances. But if they're not also pushing us toward Christ, we need to be wary of that. Listen, there's some good Christian financial wizards out there. I mean, that's not a good term to use. Good Christian financial gurus. Uh, uh, guys know their finances, okay? Uh, uh, really well. Uh, good Christian financial professionals. There we go. There's some good ones out there. There are some that have huge programs and that we've, we've done here because they're very good. But you've got to be careful because most of the time they also totally eliminate the leading of the Holy Spirit with your finances. That doesn't line up with Scripture either. So we've got to be zealously affected in the right way. Two things to remember from the example of Paul in these verses and we're going to be done. Keep a focused zeal and follow only those who push you toward godliness. Keep a focused zeal and follow only those who push you toward godliness. Not just push you toward good things, but push you toward godliness and sanctification. That's what we need. That's what we need. Next week, everybody, next week we're going to start on a new lesson in here called the Allegory of Two Children. Isaac, not this one, but Isaac and Ishmael. And what that represents for us here in chapter 4, along with what we've already studied, we're looking at, remember looking at uh, the Gospel of Grace here in the book of Galatians. And uh, I'm looking forward to this next study as well. You'll enjoy it. Let's have a word of prayer. And we'll uh, go into the next part of our service. Lord God, we're grateful and so thankful for, Lord, how you've blessed us and how you've, uh, uh, Lord, developed this, this fellowship in our relationship. And thank you, God, for, uh, for the, the bit of dialogue this morning. It's been good for us all as we study, uh, Lord, more of the importance of the truth and knowing the truth and knowing we have the truth and holding everything up against its light and uh, to make sure that we have the right standard Lord, I pray that uh, you would help us now as we go into our next service, Lord, that you'd be magnified and glorified, and that the Son of, Jesus, the Son of uh, God, Jesus Christ, would be lifted up, and Lord, that we would be careful to give you all the praise and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.